The Candian kings of the 17th century depended on external support to fight against encroaching Western colonizers and internal power struggles. Their most sought-after ally was the Nayakar dynasty of the South Indian Vijayanagar Empire. So, marital alliances with Nayakar princesses were important to seal the connection. In 1639, Sri Veeraparakrama Narendra Singha named his brother-in-law a Nayakar prince as designate king, thereby passing the Candian throne to the Nayakar dynasty. Henceforth, four Nayakar kings ruled Kandy until the British took control of the island in 1815. Assuming power in precarious times, these Hindu monarchs faced multiple challenges in ruling a Buddhist populace and winning over Sinhalese aristocracy whilst simultaneously fighting the encroaching British. We all know that the Kandian king who supported a revival-like thing in Kandian art was a Tamil king. This king became the main supporter of Buddhism. So he definitely had um, lots of political issues to negotiate and reconcile. And you can see that in Damulla and Degaldorua, where he paints the Mara Paraja, with the Maryas having the modern weapon, like the Tuakku. What does it mean? How do you read? How the Kandian uh, devotees would have read that, that the, the Maryas are having rifles? And this was patronized by King, uh, a Tamil king. When the Maras have rifles, and who had rifles in hand at that time? It is the, the foreigners, uh, the colonials. All of a sudden, the Mara Paraja scene becomes an expression or an extension to a contemporary political struggle. In Dambulla, he paints the history of Buddhism in Sri Lanka and the fight between Dutikamunu and Elara. So it is this Tamil king who is painting history of Buddhism and history of Sri Lanka within the temple. So, you understand the politics of Dambulla's scheme. He is claiming his right to be the ruler of this country. He is making links to Dutukamunu and Elara and to the Mara Paraja fight. You see, you see how interesting it is? So, the politics of Kandian art and politics of religious art is necessarily and has always been to empower the patron. Even before the, the European colonizers came, and Kandy was ruled by either the Sinhalese or uh, South Indian rulers. So what you can see is rather than, you know, separate worship, I think the temple had like fusion of traditions. So the people who went into those spaces may have had, you know, very different ideas about religious space. We can see that, you know, both religions were accepted and, you know, practiced at the time. If we are looking at Kandian art through Seneca Bandara Nayaka's eyes, you will realize that Kandian art is not a sudden uh, revival of Sri Lankan art. It does connect to Tiwanka, so it has its own history kind of art that we find in Kandy also happening at the same time in South India as well. So usually most people would like to say, you know, it came from, it, it was influenced from India. But I'm saying again, I, I keep saying this again and again, no, that's not the way to, to make sense of it. What do you mean came from India? We are part of that culture, cultural network. So at the same time, these things were happening in, in both places. One of the things which is amazing about Kumar Swami's book, Medieval Singhalese Art, is that he said that after Polonnaru and uh, Anuradhapura, not that uh, art declined, is that the monuments declined and it became a more egalitarian art, which means people were more equal, so there are other ways of looking at his social history. You know, to do monuments, you must have power, right? So maybe that's another coin, flip side of the coin of being able to do monuments and things like that. So, you will find that in things in egalitarian society, you got 
uh, very good craftsman who could do different different things. And that is Kumar Swami's thesis in medieval Sinhalese art. So that is what you get at medieval times. And the Nayakas brought those craftsmen, the Nayaka queens brought retinues of craftsmen to Sri Lanka whenever they came. So that is how that art flourished. I don't think we seem to have a record of that before. But maybe they also became Sri Lankanized once they came here. Quite possible Indian artists would have come here and our artists would have gone there and learned it. So they have, but what is important is this. <laughs> but this, once again, whatever it is, it got, became part of our internalized dynamics and the Sri Lankan Candian painting and the same period, South Indian Kovil paintings, they look very similar, at the same time very different as well. They're not the same. It is that different, this is what I say, like you, know, you got internalized, you, you, you made it yourself. So, <clears throat> but the difference between Candian paintings and Tiwanka paintings is like, you know, very interestingly. Candian paintings also have red background, and if you go to Tiwanka and Tiwanka, Temiya Jataka also has red background. Figures are mostly yellow. The difference is you get a lot more motifs coming in, like the lotus flowers and the, the all kinds of flowers coming into the background. You should not think they are filling the blank space. No, it was adding more meaning, bringing more idea of religiosity, more idea of experience. Because you have the figures and you have this larger circular lotus. All of a sudden there's an imbalance between the scale of the lotus figure and the human figures. So it brings in a certain dynamism into the composition. And also it gives more meaning. So it is not just filling, you know, filling the blanks. But you see, you know, these traditional artists use three kinds of composition in Buddhist temples. One is this huge composition, like the Mara Paraja, or the uh, Buddha coming down from Sankhisa. They are this huge, they are always larger than life. And you go to Dambulla, they are huge. And even you know, so in Tiwanka, it's huge. And then, then you have what Bandara Naika calls monumental scale compositions, like the raw Frahatans. They look the same, but they are very monumental, and they are very grand, and, but they, they are of the same, uh, like human scale. Like, you find that, that composition everywhere, in Dambulla, in, uh, in Candian murals. And then, the, then you have the registers, paintings on registers. You know, they are telling stories. So, when they tell a story, they use a particular kind of composition. When they want to make the devotee part of the whole dynamic going on, action going on it, they make this composition of, of the Rahatans at the same scale of living human being. So it's also directional. It shows you where the main image is. You follow them, you go to the main image. And then when you go to the main image, you come across these huge compositions, like the Maharaparaja and all that. That scheme of composition is also found in Kandy, also in Tiwanka, also in, uh, in, uh, in uh, all the way they call the world. But when it comes to Southern region, you don't find it, that mega compositions. You have the registers, you have monumental scale, like the human scale designs, but not these huge ones. Except the floor, Candian temples are painted, the walls, the statues, the ceiling, all colorful. It's a very different world. You walk inside the shrine room, it's fabulous, painted. You walk into a world of colors. So there is this strong attraction, command, that the paintings make upon you. Because by their sheer presence, the sheer, sheer colors. And then it tries to tell this, uh, absorb you into this, uh, into this world of Buddhism. This is why I think what um, the temples are doing to us. This is why temples are being repainted again and again. Because I don't get the same color attraction or, or the power of color when you walk into a Hindu shrine though. Not not in South India. They are, it's a very different feel. But if you look at grand complexes throughout the world, religious complexes, they were never done in one period. Even St. Peter's is done over a, several generations. But the end result adds to the totality. I think that is what a master can do.
you know, I mean, I, I think that this whole, I think very few people have the finances to be able to build at one go. And I think that things like the Dalada Malikava is picturesque. Though done at various times, they were not done at one time, they were done at various times. You could say it epitomizes candy. It's a single standing building. It has a two pitch roof. And the Independence Memorial is done based on the Magul Madhuva on a high plinth to give it a grandness. But you also get the little Trinity College Chapel in Candy done by Gaston in 1916, maybe a hundred, two hundred years afterwards, being influenced by the same building. This notion of uh, doing two pitch roofs, a lot of people give a lot of explanations, all I think are rather wrong. That is to say that they always say that it uh, distinguishes a central space from a veranda around, uh, that it takes the rainwater from the foundation which is built off the ground, and so on. But no, it, it is a, again a Chinese device, even the Chinese roofs curve, because it makes the roof lighter. Because if you did one pitch, it makes the roof heavier on the ground. So when you do two pitches or even three, like in China, it makes the weight go laterally. In uh, Sri Lanka, except for another thing called Panaviti Ambalama, which has equally good carvings, you don't have too many uh, architectural buildings which are carved. You know, more than the carvings, I think that the pay cutters, which are the, on top of the columns, uh, uh, I think those are rather beautiful because they show variations of lotuses. You don't get buildings with that carving ability in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, when you look at what we have, these are the best. You see, in Kandy, we have three really interesting temples. Gadladeniya, Lankatilaka and Ambekka. Ambekka is a Dewali. Lankatilaka and Gadladeniya are temples. But, but these three shrines, you use the word shrine for all three, they share so much, a kind of a, some, some link, because they are in the same uh, geographical area. And Bakke has all these uh, wood carvings. They all show the presence of, now I'm going to use, the, of South India and Sri Lanka. Shanta Pinuma Vinuta, I mean, Hindu Lakshana Ava. Okay, good up, Barapatha Vidrava, and Uruguay, and Uruguay Pinuma, I mean, Adavan Dinatakne, I mean, Bohoman younger Hindu. According to Kumaraswamy, Karladeniya is built by a uh, South Indian architect. So, you know, once again, I, what I'm asking you is like, you know, it is, it would not explain the complexity of places like uh, Karladeniya, Ambekke, and Lankati, like, and Kandy, if you just think they came from India or came from South India. No. This is how Kumaraswamy also tackles this issue. Even though Kumaraswamy calls his this very famous book, Medieval Sinhalese Art, that Sinhalese is very different than what we, what our popular nationalists want to think about the idea of, of Sinhalese. That Sinhalese is very much part of India. And anyone who's listening to me would think that, you know, I'm actually pro-India. No, it is not being pro-India, it is just being very archaeological. And trying to make sense of the theory of proximity. No, Sri Lanka is close to a large land mass. And, and what can happen when you are close to a large land mass? You know, it is a huge civilization. So we are not a separate from, we are part of that. It's once again, I'm attacking, I'm critiquing the colonial way of looking at Sri Lanka, putting it aside and, you know, making it a discrete place and then going that idea into extreme nationalism, that we try to look for something truly, truly Sri Lankan, even in the prehistoric periods. You know, you listen to this popular archaeology, archaeologist speaking, there is something called apem, our own, essentially our own something. You know. Candy is very interesting because it's, uh, because it was a kingdom. Uh, it's a very hierarchical space in that sense. So in the current candy, you have Dalada Maligava as the center space. And then you, of course, have the four important Devales, 
around it. And I think it's very interesting that you have three Devalis that are very close to the Maligava and then the Kadargama Devali, which is slightly at, at a distance. If I take the first Devali that follows the uh, tooth relic, and that what used to be the first Devali that led the original procession as well, which is the Natha Devali. If you talk to people, you know, Natha is primarily a, a Buddhist deity. The standard understanding is that he is the Mahayana Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. Other people might say he is actually the Bodhisattva Maitreya, who is going to be the next Buddha. The Natha Devan itself, I think, is a very interesting space because I think one of the oldest buildings in the entirety of Kandy, and it has been dated to around the 14th century. It was also the space where the kings went to choose the name, the, the new king would choose the name that they would take on. Also, that's where their sacred sword was strapped onto them, so that you still have in uh, the Nata Devali Perhara, the main elephant, the main ornament of Nata is the sword that is carried, which recalls so this very important function that was played by the Devali in the time of the monarchs. And it's also one of the ones that is in the most closest proximity to the temple of the tooth. The next one that is in procession is, is the Vishnu uh, Devale. And, and I think Vishnu is actually particularly fascinating because when you, as soon as you say Vishnu, the understanding is that he is a Hindu deity, he's, he's a god. But in the Buddhist tradition, he has really been Buddhist and he's actually completely different. So, I mean, a lot of people say he's the Buddhist Vishnu to differentiate from the Hindu Vishnu. Uh, oftentimes, he has been merged with an earlier deity who was called Upulvan, who was uh, called you know, the, the blue of the water lily. The Vishnu Devali is also the one that is called the Mahadevali. So, it has a very important position within in the Perhara context as well as in kingship, because that's actually where uh, the kings were consecrated. And then, of course, you have the Kataragama Devali. And interestingly, as I said, Kataragama is further away from the Temple of the Tooth. And that's the only Devali that has a Tamil priest uh, in today's context. But once again, Kataragama has been tamed to Buddhism in a sense, right? So and another part is that within the Kandyan period, these four Devalis are seen as the guardians of Sri Lanka. Though in the Perahara, when you see, you can immediately mark out the Kataragama Devali, for example, because they have, they will dance with Kavadi, for example, or you'll, you'll have the peacock feathers that are very much in evidence. So the Kavadi is very interesting because it recalls the other kinds of, you know, trance uh, rituals that take place in the more Hindu. Uh, um, you know, Kovils as well to Lord Mohan, but then they have been somehow domesticated and Buddhized within the Perahara. And then, of course, finally, you have uh, the Patini Devale, uh, and it's one of your very ancient Devales, not architecturally, but in, in terms of the beliefs. Um, and it, that's very close to the Nata Devale. Patini is very interesting because within Theravada Buddhism, you don't really have many. A female deity. Actually, you have no female deity. So she is the only female deity that has been incorporated and Buddhized. And of course, uh, her uh, most interesting kind of art object is the anklet. So iconographically, you it can immediately note, you know, uh, any kind of Patini Devale. And so the anklet uh, is very important at the Kandy Devale as well. And so a lot of the blessings that take place are with the use of the anklet. And in the Kandy Perhara, earlier on, the Patini Devali was the only one that had uh, women dancers. Vishwatan, the Thero has come up very beautiful idea. He was totally telling, this is wrong to understand insulated or isolated beings. He was talking about inter-beings. He was telling that beings are inter. That is, you know, uh, sharing with each other, with, with almost everything, whatever, not this being. We can, in the same way, we can say religions are inter-religions, cultures are inter-cultures. There are no isolated cultures, there's no insulated religions. I mean, that is very beautiful.
Tati. <risa>